Um, Labai Achu, Labas Ritas, Ach Prashabit, Ash Kalvieso, Anglish Kai, uh, Chindian, and Shao Manu, uh, Lietavos Kalva Buvo, uh, Geriabit, uh, Dabar. It's, it's not as good as it was. And um, I want to, first of all, just thank you for this enormous honor to be here. I never thought in, I thought many things would happen to me in my life. I never thought I'd get an honorary doctorate, and this is a, both a huge surprise and a, and a huge, huge pleasure. And particularly to get it here in Kaunas, which is a city that I visited so often, both in the occupation period and in the four years that I was living in Lithuania, and has a very special place in my heart um, for, 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 many, for many reasons. Um, my title today is Lithuanian Lessons, and I mean this in several senses, but the first is the, the lessons that Lithuania taught me, because I think that Lithuania has been part of the um, university of life for me. It's where I've learned some things which have stayed with me in all the years since. Um, and I think the first of those was just the, the real encounter with the evil of the Soviet occupation and the suffering that it brought. That although I'd been a very strong cold warrior in London in the 1970s and 80s, and I'd worked with victims of psychiatric abuse from the Soviet system and with dissidents and emigres, it was all a bit second-hand. And even in Czechoslovakia and East Germany, where I'd lived and worked under communism, it wasn't as bad as it had been in the Soviet Union. And to live here and meet people who'd been in the Gulag, been deported, and to see all the um, evidence of the 50 years of both Nazi and Soviet occupation really brought it home to me. And it was the most valuable, I, I think, experience of my life to get just a bit of a feeling of what it had been like for people um, living actually inside the Soviet Union. And along with that came another very important lesson, which is what Václav Havel called the power of the powerless. And I'd experienced that, again, in Czechoslovakia, where I'd seen the Czechs um, filling Wenceslas Square with their incredible demonstrations from November the 17th onwards. But I always remember in the summer of 1989, I was with some Czech friends who were debating in a very Czech way whether they were brave enough to really join the, the opposition and sign a petition that was going around the, um, the, the then Czechoslovakia called Nikolik Viet, several sentences. And this was a kind of public expression of resistance to the regime. People knew that if they signed it and if things went wrong, maybe they would lose their jobs, maybe their children wouldn't go to university. And I was at my friends, it was August the 23rd um, of uh, 1989, and they, they had um, a satellite and we were watching Sky News. And we were watching the Baltic Way. And it was most extraordinary, because I was quite familiar with, with the events. They were less familiar with the events of the Baltic States. And I remember that the, one of them said to the other, if the Estonians and Latvians and Lithuanians can do that in conditions of such difficulty, why can't we sign this petition? And it was a very, it was a very important, important moment, I think, that you showed what could be done in your very difficult circumstances in a way that really energized people and perhaps in less, less difficult ones. Um, another lesson that living here taught me was what I call the weight of ignorance. I moved to Lithuania when Lithuania was literally not on the map. If you bought a map of the world, it showed Lithuanian Social Soviet Socialist Republic. It didn't show Lithuania. And for the four years that I was here, I was watching Lithuania trying to get back on the map in every sense, and sometimes literally. I used to collect, and I think I still have, a collection of bad maps produced in 91, 92, and 93, which would show, for example, um, the Kaliningrad um, exclave labeled as Lithuania, and Lithuania labeled as Belarus, or sometimes the other way around, Lithuania labeled as Kaliningrad, and Kaliningrad labeled as Lithuania, um, sometimes showing all three Baltic states together under one of the three names the difficulty of getting across the idea that the Lithuanian language was interesting and mattered, 
And people would say, well, why can't they all just speak Russian? It would be so much simpler. And I remember arguing very strongly with various foreign ministries, which I won't mention by name, because I don't want to embarrass my dear friends in the British Foreign Office, um, that it was important to send diplomats here who actually spoke Lithuanian, and not just send people who um, spoke Russian, because that would somehow do. The idea that Lithuanian culture was interesting, Lithuanian art was interesting. Um, it was very hard to get across. People would say, well, of course, former Soviet Union is, um, that's basically Russian literature um, and Russian art, is, isn't it? And breaking down these stereotypes. I remember in the, after the events of January the 13th, um, Miwash, Brodsky, and Ventslava wrote a joint letter to the New York Times. A very good, powerful letter. And I knew Brodsky, and I knew Miwash, and I, and I, I knew Venstava, and I was very happy to see them um, doing this. But I was living in Washington in those months, and I remember talking to a very distinguished expert in um, what we used to call Eastern Europe, who said, that's a great letter from Brodsky and Milosh, but who's the other guy? <laughs> And I explained that Venstler was a very serious and interesting poet, a world-class poet. And I think you've done a fantastic job over the 20-something years since then. But it's, I've never forgotten the, the, the shared feeling I had with Lithuanians of just trying to get heard, just trying to get noticed, just trying to be taken seriously, just trying to break through that weight of ignorance and those lazy stereotypes with very deep roots that people have in the outside world that only big things and big countries and big languages matter. So the fourth lesson which I learned was to distrust very much my own profession of journalism. And I call this the power of confusion. We make the mistake as journalists of reporting the news, which is our job, and then putting the news together and trying to create a coherent narrative out of it. And then that becomes the big story. And I look back on the stories I wrote from Lithuania in 91, 92, 93, 94. And some of them I'm very happy with, big stories about big changes. But a lot of the stories I wrote about look very trivial in retrospect. Why did I pay so much attention to a mafia boss called Dekanidze, for example, and a, I believe, possibly even from Kaunas, man called Daktaras. But they were big figures in Lithuania in those days. It really mattered, you know, what is happening with the mafia. Now the mafia is, uh, is, 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 is history. Maybe there are even people here now writing about it from an anthropological point of view. I remember the um, enormous uh, efforts that we put in to talking about really quite small things to do with the day-to-day -day politics, the splitting of the samus into the lords and the commons. There was a time when they were meeting separately. And again, there was far too much attention went onto this kind of trivia. And I think that it's, it's always made me very skeptical of the, uh, any journalistic ability to see the big picture because you're so tied up in the, in the many small pictures. You really have to step back from the day's news and the big changes that were happening in Lithuania in 92, 93, 94 were really nothing to do with the day-to-day -day news. They were about deep social, mental, psychological, emotional shifts as people got ready to live lives as free citizens in a free country, in a free Europe dumping the old habits and attitudes and um, assumptions of, of, of the Soviet period. And that was something that was been quite difficult to write about, but it was actually the most important thing that happened. I think it's also a mistake to stitch together your day-to-day -day frustrations in a narrative. And when I look back at the diary that I kept in Lithuania, in 1992 to 94. It was all about things that seemed tremendously important to me at the time, like how to get across the Lesdini border crossing. Every time we wanted to go to Poland, this was the most enormous procedure involving going to my dear friends at the foreign ministry and trying to get a letter from them, 
considering whether it would be better perhaps to drive to Tallinn and take the ferry, but this feeling of the claustrophobic difficulty of just getting out of the country, the difficulty of making telephone calls. I remember in the, my diary the day it became possible to make an international direct dial telephone call to anywhere in the world. And I was so pleased, I wrote my diary for that day in red ink, because it was such a red ink, no longer having to phone up and order the call from the exchange. Again, in retrospect, this seems something quite trivial. Of course, sooner or later, we were going to get direct dial telephones here. Why make such a big deal about it? The day the first mobile phone arrived, again, tremendously important. We treated it like some kind of sacred relic, this wonderful thing of a mobile phone. And now, I guess everybody here has one in their pocket, and you don't even think about it. Um, so I, I think this maybe have a bearing on the very difficult situation in Ukraine right now. I would like to think that when we look back on the years 2014, 2015, 2016 in Ukraine, we will say this is actually the birth of a new Ukraine, of a new mentality, of a new relationship between state and society, a newly integrated Ukraine. Um, internally and externally, and all these terrible difficulties that we're looking at will seem more like details, at least I hope so. But that's my lesson, my main lesson from looking at Lithuania in the early 90s, is the stuff you think matter doesn't matter, and the stuff that really matters is the stuff you don't notice. But I think it might be just worth turning briefly, um, and I'm sorry that we don't have um, so much time, but I, will, um, I think we, we need to spend a bit of time on the modern Lithuanian lessons. What are the lessons for Lithuania of the events that we are seeing now around us in what I fear is the gravest European security crisis of really of my lifetime? I was born in 1962 and I think this is worse than the Soviet invasion or the Soviet-led invasion of Czechoslovakia in 68. It's worse than um, the any of the, you know, the imposition of martial law in Poland. This is a, a fundamental challenge to the European security order with extremely grave, dangerous potential consequences. Um, it's particularly unfortunate that most of the West doesn't realize this. You realize it here very clearly because you're on the front line and there are individual politicians in the West who realize it. But we are in the position really with the, the house is on fire and most of the people in the house are still asleep inside. Or maybe saying, maybe we should open a window, it's getting a bit smoky in here, but not actually rousing what's going on. And I think the first lesson for Lithuanians, which may be a very difficult one to understand, is that there are other people who are worse off than you. We've spent a lot of time looking at the Baltic states as frontline states and saying this is, from a military point of view, very difficult, it's economically vulnerable, the energy situation isn't great, there's all these problems, and these are all real problems. And you're right to worry about them, I don't discount them for a moment. But let's just look a little bit further south. At least here, in Lithuania, you have a broad national consensus that there is a problem, you want to defend your country, you have a clear message to your allies. Just try going to Bulgaria. Just try going to the Croatia or Slovenia. Just, in fact, try going to Hungary, where that kind of awareness of what's going on is missing. And I have Bulgarian friends who feel as isolated in Bulgaria, talking about the threat from Russia, as I used to in Europe 10 years ago. Um, the Russian influence in south southern and southeastern Europe is far greater and far more effective than in the, in the Baltic states. And although I'm quite convinced that this is an absolutely vital theatre um, in this geopolitical crisis we're in, um, do please count your blessings. There are other places where it's much, where it's much, much worse. Um, the second thing I think we need to, to bear in mind is that Russia will attack um, its adversaries, not in the way that the adversaries expect, but in the way that they don't expect. And I think this is one of the great weaknesses in Western thinking, is that we think that the problem with Russia will happen on our terms, that Russia will announce that in six weeks' time it intends to attack the island of Gotland. And that will be a nice six-week period during which we can then do what we need to do to protect the Swedes and protect Gotland. That is not going to happen. 
The Russians are not stupid. They will attack where we do not expect and on things that were weak rather than on where we expect and the things were, were, were strong. And this is the so-called con concept of hybrid warfare, which is we are, now, we are now facing, which has, I think I counted 15 different elements in this, and I won't list them all now, but only one of them is conventional military. All the others are non-military, but potentially very damaging threats. For example, cyber attack. For example, financial panic. It was very interesting in Bulgaria when the Russians were putting pressure on Bulgaria that they were able to send text messages to all the customers of a particular bank saying, watch out, your money's not safe. That was a, they created a, a, a nice financial panic, just like that. That's a completely different non-military vulnerability. The use of information warfare, you've seen it here very clearly in the Baltic states with Russian language media, which is an information weapon. It's not journalism, it's, it's propaganda, and it's designed to undermine and demoralize and to um, subvert just the way that Reichsender 1 and Reichsender 2 were used by Nazi Germany to whip up a pin in, in the Sudetenland among the Sudeten Germans in pre-war Czechoslovakia. Um, information warfare, something the West is not used to. Um, Energy, you've done exactly the right thing here by getting your, your terminal and LNG, um, but Russia is still very well able to use the energy weapon, not just in terms of cutoffs and energy sanctions, but also with all the dirty money that flows around energy deals. Um, the use of intelligence and special, what they would call active intelligence, active measures, both collecting information and then using people who've been um, planted in a political system to exert, um, to, to exert influence. And I could go on, I, there's, there's, I think I've written an article which is um, possibly coming out in Delphi next week, where I list all the different kinds of, um, the elements of hybrid warfare. But the point for you is to work out how you can strengthen yourself against all of these. And I've jotted down a few points, four, I think, which are, which are really important. And the first is resilience. You have to expect that when you are first attacked with something like this, it's not going to go well. You, will be, you, you have to be ready to take a punch and then push back from that. But the correct response to an attack is not to panic, it's to do defense and perhaps to counterattack. Um, but this feeling of resilience that you are actually, we in the West are actually very strong. We have in the European Union a combined GDP of $20 trillion, and the United States and it's $40 trillion. The combined population of the United States and the European Union is 800 million people. Russia has a $2 trillion economy, it's about the size of Italy, and it has 140 million people. So objectively, as the Russians would say, Russia is weaker than we are. If Russia is winning, it is because our will is weak rather than because Russia is strong. And the solution for, for weak willpower is strong willpower. So a sense of confidence and resilience is my first point. Um, being aware of Russia's ability to sow internal dissension and intolerance. Russia has done very well in Ukraine by putting money into extremist political parties on the right. And there's no doubt in my mind that some of these ultra-right Ukrainian parties are the puppets, either the witting or the unwitting puppets of Moscow. So anything that encourages prejudice and intolerance and division is feeding into the, um, into the, Russian, um, in, into the Russian hands. And one of the great assets that we have is that we have, actually I would add humour as well to this, humour and tolerance and decency in the way we, we deal with each other, which is the antithesis of the way the system works in, um, in, in Russia. So maintaining those kind of moral qualities of our system is, strengthens the immune system, um, as it, to use a biological analogy, um, against the, um, these kind of hybrid threats. The third point, I think, is what I might call integration, joined up government. Now, I come from a country which is very bad at this. We have a very strong sense in Britain that things should be kept separate. So our intelligence service doesn't talk to our police, our police don't talk to our financial regulator, our financial regulator doesn't talk to our company's registration office. And this is 
very good, maybe from a kind of formalistic legal point of view, but it doesn't help when you're dealing with a joined up threat. And we are facing a joined up threat from Russia, where the same person can be pretending to work for Gazprom in the morning, he can be a Russian intelligence officer in the afternoon, and have some kind of role with an NGO in the evening. And we need, and it's probably easier in a small country than a big one, to have a joined up response to this threat. So all our agencies, public and private, and all our institutions, need to be in communication and to be aware that we are under attack. This internal integration um, is one side of it. It's also external integration. The more we can integrate with the outside world, um, and I mean here not just Western institutions, but also, for example, Ukrainian ones. I think it would be, it's absolutely fantastic. I was hearing about this from Sharonis in the car, all the links that you have with Ukrainian universities. This is a great model, and I encourage everybody, every other university, to do this. The more we can build these horizontal contacts with other um, partner institutions, whatever our own institution is, I'm doing this with journalists. I'm trying to create a kind of network of journalists who will respond to Russian information warfare. But I think the more we can do this kind of external integration, um, the better. And then finally, communication, getting the message across. And this is something which I think Lithuania has not been great at um, in the past. I've spent many, many hours in meetings with Lithuanian officials who've been asking me, what can we do to improve um, Lithuania's image in the outside world? And I've always said that you don't, when you've got a story to tell that's good, then start worrying about how to tell it. But first of all, get the, get, get the, get the messaging right and then think about delivery. And I think this is still something where there's a lot of room for improvement of getting across the idea that Lithuania is a success story. This is the exact opposite of the Russian propaganda which tries to portray all the former communist countries as failed states. But having a well-resourced and well-designed public messaging, both internally and externally, to counter this Russian narrative of failure and of isolation. So those are my, um, those are my Lithuanian lessons um, for Lithuania. And I've told you about my Lithuanian lessons for me. And I would just finish in the final couple of minutes um, by saying what I think the Lithuanian lessons for the outside world are. And they're to listen. I say this again and again and again, when I'm, whether I'm in Washington or in Brussels or in London or Berlin. If you had listened to the Lithuanians and the Estonians and the Latvians and the Czechs back in 1990-91, you'd have saved yourself an awful lot of time. Because none of this should come as a surprise. And this is the most annoying thing, and I get really, I sometimes become quite un-British and lose my temper when people who I wouldn't want to name, but for example, a former NATO Secretary General said at a meeting in Chatham House, I think we're all very surprised about what's happened. I said, I'm sorry, Lord Robertson, I said. Um, if you're surprised, you just haven't been paying attention. This was, at, it was clear from 1991 that if, you, if the Soviet Union collapses and the country that takes its place does not get rid of its dreams of empire, does not deal with the KGB, and does not come to terms with the crimes of the past, we're going to have a problem sooner or later. And that was clear under Yeltsin, even before it was even clearer under Putin. So you have, I think, can pat yourselves on the back, although perhaps not in your academic garb at the moment, because you might not be able to reach. But I think Lithuanians, you know, you've basically, you've been right about this, and the West has not listened. And I don't know what more I could have done um, over the last 20 years to try and amplify this message. But fundamentally, this message came from you. You are the people who really understood this. Um, you and your Baltic colleagues and the other, other former captive nations. And we didn't listen. And it's been a very expensive and painful um, process of our education, of our Lithuanian lessons, which we unfortunately, I don't think we have completed the course yet. And for many European politicians, um, they are only at the very beginning of this course. And what's so tragic about this is the price of this course is being paid not by the Westerners who didn't listen, but by the Ukrainians. Thank you very much indeed.